Hello, everybody. How are we doing? Um, Dave Archer here. Um, a lot of you might know me, some of you might not. Um, I'm talking about foxes today. Um, go back to the Queen's Silver Jubilee and punk rock. It's actually when I started in this industry, heck of a long time ago. Um, and most of my work has been rural pest control. And today we, we really are sort of up against timescale because I could talk all day about foxes. Um, but most of pests, you know, but I like the rural side of pest control. Um, there is certainly a market for it. Um, but what are we talking about? We've got a picture here to show you. This is the chap we're talking about. It's a red fox. Now, interestingly enough, people say, why do we use the Latin names? And the Latin name here, Volpes Volpes. Well, the reason that we do use Latin names is not to make us sound pompous, but if somebody's talking about this fox as opposed to this red fox we're talking about a sierra nevada fox here now unless you are talking in the latin terminology you might be talking about a completely different type of animal so just a quick one there as to why latin names are important okay um we're going to have a few words of the day uh, on this just to sort of concentrate your mind on what we're talking about the first thing we're talking about is foxes are Volpes, Volpes. Remember that. That's the one we're talking about. What about Volpes, Volpes? Well, he's found all over Europe, um, north, northern hemispheres, uh, even down into Australia. And people try and take a stab at the numbers. Pretty difficult, I would say. It's a bit like you're never more than 10 foot away from a rat. Really? Haven't they just taken the, the numbers of rats and the amount of people and, you know, done, done some sort of uh, number crunching on it? Well, with foxes, um, Especially in rural areas, yes, the numbers fluctuate, and it still surprises me how many foxes can be around in rural areas. Um, um, urban areas, um, well, what sort of a problem have we got there? This kind of thing. You've all seen these kind of headlines, and I'm guessing that you've all, all thought, is that really true? Can they really do that? Um, I would suggest that <laughs> never be surprised by any wild animal that would be my 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 sort of response to that. They, they, still, uh, they still surprise me, probably on a weekly basis. Um, but um, what, what about our foxes? What, what, what problems do they really cause then in the countryside, Dave? Well, um, they're certainly, they're, they're a curious animal. There's no doubt about that. And they're opportunists. Um, you'll often find that I find cubs which have died in swimming pools. I'll find adults that even fall into swimming pools. Obviously, a lot get killed on the road. Um, but then you'll also find them tangled up in netting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they, are, they are, like I say, a curious animal, um, but they are also omnivorous. I was going to put that down as a word, but, you know, pretty well everybody knows omnivorous. No? Okay, an omnivorous, omnivorous animal, he'll, he'll eat meat, he'll eat vegetables, he'll eat pretty well anything which has got sort of protein in it. It doesn't matter how old and rancid it is, by the way. He's not bothered about that. It's, a, it's something that will fill him up, especially when it's cold like this, he'll go for it. Um, in towns, pretty well all you can do is cage trap foxes. As a generality, you know, you certainly don't want to be drawing attention to yourself. And most of these methods here, let me just say, do not apply to anything in an urban environment. We're talking about rural foxes here. OK, um, so um, what have we got? We've got an animal which has got no closed season. By closed season, we're talking about um, a, a time when an animal is, is not allowed to be um, controlled. Now, foxes don't fall into that, that remit. You can control foxes any time of year. But why, should we say, would we, would we need to do it? Well, first off, um, it, any action we're going to take, it's got to be lawful. Just because you control them at any time of year, it doesn't mean you can do what you want. Uh, you can't, for instance, uh, gas them, and you certainly can't poison them. And that's a good point for any pest controllers who are uh, poisoning rats. Always, you know, like the milkman, go and pick up your empties. Because if you, if you don't, and foxes are scavenging, it's, it's, it's bad for our industry and it's bad for the environment. Whatever action you're taking, don't, don't sort of not, not care about what's happening out there. That, that's, that's no good. Um, so pick up your empties on, on the rats, OK? Um, it's also for, you know, the older I get, uh, it's got to be morally okay as well. Uh, why are you actually carrying out this work? 
are you, are, you, are, you, are you really convinced that you need to be doing this work? By that, I'm saying, if somebody's got, say, for instance, hens, now that may be a commercial flock of hens. They may have thousands of hens. They may have half a dozen to a dozen hens. Now, if those hens are out in the daytime and they're unprotected, What's old Foxy Luxy supposed to do? Is he going to go and eat an earthworm or try and dig up a beetle? Of course he's not. Of course he's not. And there's something else as well. If you are taking that, that one fox, that's not going to solve the problem. It might make the, the householder feel good. You know, the hens that have got their names, or she's named them, and, and Foxy's had three or four of them, yeah, of course she's un- upset. But you take that one fox, there will be others waiting there to, to have a go. So the best thing in those cases, advise people what to do, proof the area, put electric fencing up, put anything up, you know, the big hole in the netting where it's obvious that a fox can go through without touching the sides. And I see this all the time. Those jobs, get to speak to people and say, look, get, get, get your hens or whatever it is um, sorted. What we really have problems with is where we have and especially it's just coming on at this time of year, when it comes on to lambing time, okay? Foxes will know about the the fact that, you know, sheep are about to lamb. And I've got a field behind me, I'm looking at these sheep now, and I saw two foxes in there last night. They're just getting ready for lambing time. Now, I didn't learn most of this stuff about foxes by... by, well, of course, I did read books, but most of it was, you know, getting out and seeing foxes and learning about them, throwing myself into, a, you know, the corner of a field, especially on cut grass and watching what foxes do and what a learning curve it is. I tell you, I could be out there pretty well all day just watching, looking and learning. We're going to go through some control bits and bobs in a minute, um, but there is no better teacher than yourself out there um, to look and learn. So. Okay, what, what, what have we got then? Um, why don't farmers do this control? Well, actually, not all farmers have, have guns, despite what the media say. And no disrespect to any farmers, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that a lot of them aren't competent in, in, in control. It's rather like, why would you assume that they would use a pest control contractor for, for using uh, on rat control when they wouldn't use somebody to do professional pest control for larger mammals. And this is where my work comes in. And why would they need it anyway? Um, Well, the the financial cost of foxes taking lambs is enormous. The financial cost of a fox in hen houses is enormous, especially in commercial houses. You know, if if one gets in there, I tell you, you watch a fox when his head's gone. Well, I mean, wow, in a frenzy. He'll go wild. He doesn't care. He doesn't care how many he's killed or how many he's maimed. You know, we're the only ones that feel sort of compassion. A fox would never feel compassion. So don't confuse the sort of moral issues of, of, of what you do. But, but when you are going to do this control, make sure you're doing it as humanely and as well as you can. Okay? Um, now, um, I've actually just been to a job, you know, when we're talking about hen houses. And another pest controller was with me, bear this out. Do you know a fox actually chewed a hole into the, in through the wood and was splintering the wood to get into those hens? It was almost like, a you know, here's Johnny coming in to try and get into the hens. I couldn't believe it. After all these years, and I'm looking, I'm thinking, wowee, you would still do that. Now, his, he was obviously, of a, but these things are hungry. You know, you're not going to stand out there uh, uh, when it's sort of minus two, minus three. God, you're getting hungry, so they'll try any chance to get their food. But before you start on any of this, on any of it, you've got to have your landowner's permission. Landowner's permission. Yeah, okay, Dave, we'll just go out there and do the work. Really? I'll tell you what, like that chap's just saying, back foot's a bad place to be. So wonderful Dave, he gets his form here. And I get this form signed. I even tell the police what I'm doing. Um, At this time of year, interestingly enough, coronavirus, you cannot go recreationally shooting. If you do, you're breaking the rules and you're going to be in big trouble. But the police, believe it or not, even ring me to say, you're a professional man, you using firearms, you're the man that we want to go and do this work. And it's quite surprising. You know, it's a, it's a spin-off, if you like, of, 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 of bad times. Um, but yeah, get your form signed. Get yourself, don't get yourself on your back foot. Um, 
and your insurance. Now, this might surprise you, but if you're a member of, of uh, a shooting organization, your insurance only covers you for recreational shooting. And this isn't recreational work. Any form of payment, whether, whether that's rabbits that you're taking off site, any form of payment is payment, whether it's payment in kind or payment in money. So if you're um, doing this work and it is employment, then you need to make sure that on your insurance, it is stated that you can, go sh you can use it for shooting and what species you're doing it for. Very important point. So don't assume that your recreational shooting will cover you. It won't. So from all of that, yes, of course, we've got relevant pest control. Of course it is. It's a, it's a very, very niche part. But isn't that the great part of our industry? Somebody goes wild about bed bugs. To be honest, they're not my, my bag, but I'm not knocking it at all. Somebody else would say, I'm not interested in fox control. I'm not interested in rabbit control. But it's been my life, and I, you know, I, I, <laughs> I really enjoy it. Um, and also, this thing about giving advice on pests, it can lead you on to say, if they've got rabbits on spring barley, you might have a real good job then controlling the, the, their rabbit population, or it might get you onto their other forms of pest control. They'll certainly talk to their, their friends and neighbours about it. Um, so... What are we talking about here? Certainly being discreet in any action you undertake, uh, more so than ever these days. I tell you, I don't have any writing on my truck anymore. I don't have any sort of Rambo-ish type gear. This is me. This is, look, this is the kind of fleece I wear when I'm out. It's none of this sort of camo gear. I'm not, look, I'm not knocking people who do. I'm just saying from my angle, I like to be discreet. I like to just be quietly, even in the countryside, you, you know, there are always people about out there, whether they're walking off a footpath, whatever, they come across, across a chap who's all camoed up with a gun. Well, take your chances. I, you know, it's, it's not for me. Um, there you are. Um, so, uh, another thing about foxes, some, you know, some of them won't prey on stock. It's a real strange thing. They're as individual as us. You'll find that some in lambing fields will only be going for afterbirths. And they're not interested in lambs. But you see foxes that start to get interested in lambs. And even when they've got their little wrappers on them, I tell you, it's just like a Mars bar for them. They'll, they'll rip that off. They'll take the lambs uh, and they will drag them off. And I find lambs on barbed wire fences try to be pulled through. Um, it's pretty distressing stuff, I must say. And it's also incredible. You know, I see farmers in tears. They've, they've put a lot of time and effort into this stock, and foxes are ripping these apart. And I'm talking about the frenzy. When their head goes on this stuff, they get bolder and bolder and bolder. And don't think a fox is, is a no, no, nocturnal animal is a second word. That's what he is. In my, in my humble opinion, that's the fella. He's crespuscular. What do you mean by crespuscular, Dave? Well, he's more active at dusk. He doesn't come out when it's black dark. He will come out when it's just about sort of getting on dust. Dark. But you will also find this same fox, when his head goes, he'll be out there in broad daylight, absolutely strolling around the, around the lambing fields uh, and, and, and picking them off and just grabbing what he can. I've just remembered this one. Last year, or was it the year before, there were lambs which were being predated so much, they were actually in, they put them into a lambing crate. And these lambs were petrified. Seriously, absolutely up against the corner because so many of their mates and relatives have been hammered. When I got there, it, it was only about four o'clock in the afternoon, but I sensed that, there were, that he was about. I don't mean the wonderful Dave. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that I, I knew that, that, that Foxy was about. So what did I do? I whipped and jumped in with these lambs, got my tripod, got my rifle ready, and you know what? He was just coming up that field. All I did, by the way, I'm going to show you this in a minute. This is just my hand. Great, Dave. But this, cool. I'll tell you what, I'll call any fox. That's just field craft, if you like. But that fox suddenly thought, oh, yeah, there's another free meal. Well, it wasn't a free meal. It was Dave. Bang. And I'll tell you what, that was... That was Fine. After that, there was no, no more, more trouble there. It was just one fox whose head had gone and he wanted to get those lambs. And I tell you, if I hadn't been there, he'd have been in that crate and had them, 100%. So um, what if, if, if you're interested in this stuff, by the way, the best thing I can say to you, if you've got permission, don't just go wandering over fields, but if you've got permission, 
get yourself out onto some cut grass in the middle of the daytime. By that, I'm talking about big fields for, for, for haymaking or silage. And just try and... And you sit and watch and see and see how, flo- how close you can call a fox. Now, another thing on, on this, you smell. Sorry, what did you say, Dave? I smell. We absolutely smell, and we smell more than we realise because our sense of smell is hopeless. But to a fox, he will smell you from over a field away. He will, honestly. So if you are going to sit there, take account a, a of where the wind's blowing through. Don't, don't sit there where your, 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 your scent is going to go across the field. Get yourself tucked down the other side. And don't even take your, your you know, well, like if you haven't got permission, you can't, but anything down there apart from yourself and just sit and watch how many foxes get on there. Watch how many chopped up mice they're eating. Watch their behaviour. Watch how they pounce onto the field. Watch how they're taking life. And that's Mother Nature is the best teacher of all. Fantastic. Um, right, so... Um, it's, we're talking on field craft, um, and really, if you're looking at a field, you should, with experience, get to know where Fox is coming through. Is, if he, has he left any hair on that barbed wire? Has he left a run through? If you're getting there at dawn and you bend down, can you see the tracks and the dew? You know, all these kind of things about, if you were a Fox, where do you think you would come into a field? And you're normally not that far wrong. And, and, Certainly get a, a, a sort of game plan about what you're going to do first. Don't ever just go, or you might be lucky, and it probably is lucky in that case, but get yourself a, a, a game plan together first about what you're going to do. Yes, the pressure's on if you've got uh, foxes which are attacking stock. You'd be very lucky to, to, to sort it out, you know, as soon as you're there. You need to get your paperwork in place anyway. But... Um, uh, what have we got if we, if we are doing control then? What sort of control methods and what will help us in our control? That's, that's really the, the, the big issue here. Well, um, it isn't gung-ho stuff, this. I don't want you to think it is. I'm just showing you tools of the trade. Um, and the first thing, the first thing I want to show you is a dog lead. Oh, Dave. A dog lead? Why have you got a dog lead? Right. Pay attention. This is how, I mean, I, I, I don't put a lead on a dog, but if you were to put a lead on a dog and it's a working dog, this is a, what's known as a slip lead. It goes on like this, and the dog pulls on the tension and it lets go, and the dog pulls on and lets go. Okay? It's not cruel. Of course it's not cruel. And this is a snare. Oh, no, what was not one of those snare things. Not those things that animals get garroted and almost cut in half and, and wound around fences. Absolutely not. We're not talking here about somebody that would do it unprofessionally. We are talking about professional snaring. Now, prof- get the tie out of that. Professional snaring. What do you mean by a professional snare? They're all still cruel, aren't they? No, they're not. This is a fox snare, okay? Can you see that? It has here a breakaway linkage, and it has here a stop. Just going back to our dog lead, this is the same. Now look, watch this. So if I put that on my arm, and I pull my arm, my arm's not being cut in two, however hard I pull that, it's released again. And that's exactly the same when you're staring for foxes. The fox is not cut in two and the fox is not sitting there having a hooli and all, all sort of upset. Yes, he's been, but all he thinks is that he's just been, you know, contained, if you like. And that indeed is all, he, all that has happened to him. And we have here other linkage. Now, this linkage... This is the great thing about snaring. Honestly, I'm not just being sort of, you know, silly about this. This is, this is my life. This is my work. This is a setting tool. And this is the other part of the snare. And this goes on here and bum, 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 knock, it, knock it down underground. When you've knocked it down underground, as you pull that, you pull it sideways and the holder can't pull out of the ground. You're setting snares, never ever set them by a fence. Never set them where an animal can get wound round something else. This is the real beauty of snaring. A fox 
can go along and he can knock over. If you're setting, say, 10 snares, actually, it's a bit like mole catching. You're probably saying to the world, I'm not very confident in what I'm going to be doing here. But it doesn't really matter. And I'll tell you why it doesn't matter. Because if you've got your snare with your loop like so, and yes, okay, so you, you, you learn and you're getting your, your sort of height above the ground for him to put his head through. But if he doesn't put his head through it and he just knocks it, he doesn't know anything about it. He doesn't know what's happened here. So what a great way of containing an animal. And if you are good at your field craft and you know, say, that pile of rushes there that you've got down by that swampy area, goodness me, look where old foxes be. Oh, goodness me, look, there's a lamb's tail and a lamb's leg down there. No, I'm not joking. These are the kinds. Well, it's obvious that's where he's going through. Or there might be a load of pheasant feathers or all pigeon feathers, whatever it will be. If you set that snare a bit handy in those reeds, an old foxy loxy has gone, oops. Now, all his ears is contained. Woe betide you if you don't go back there at dusk and at dawn. Actually, I'm going back three times a day to check on these. But old fox is just sitting there, and then it's a case of humane dispatch. Put my teeth in. Humane dispatch, okay? Um, and by God, it works. Now, it's very discreet, and if there's anything else that shouldn't be caught in there or couldn't be caught in there, and that is rare. This isn't Dave just thinking, I better be politically correct here. It is rare if you know what you're doing and you've got full, full train. You've also got this breakaway linkage. So if on the weird and wonderful time that uh, you get, say, uh, a deer would put his leg in there, I've never had it happen. I honestly haven't. But the breakaway linkage here will just break away and he walks off with it, okay? And it just falls off like that dog leg would fall off. And that's the truth of it. That's the real truth of snaring. Might not sit comfortably with the sort of people that will promote bad practice and love to photograph bad practice. I'm talking about professionals here and what we do as a professional standard, okay? If you, if you put your, you don't secure your snare and it's gone, well, you know, have a, have, a, have a good serious sit down and have a talk with yourself um, on anything that goes wrong, actually. Reassess what you're doing, reevaluate it. But if you're good at that sort of work, ding dong, you're away. Okay. And it might be the case that it is a last resort, really. I'm not talking about using snaring, you know, uh, uh, as a, a sort of willy nilly, but it's a fantastic tool for those areas like lambing. Maybe it's somewhere where there's something else close by and shooting would upset people. It's all down to this evaluation, your risk assessment. I'm still risk assessing. This, this work does probably more than ever it comes into to risk assessing. So what else have we got? Well, we, we went back onto the, you know, we, okay, we're on, our, we're on our lambing field now. It's just getting on to dusk time. Foxy's heard that, okay? You'd be amazed again. Um, uh, I've got to say, it still amazes me. He would come run. Sometimes you'll see him two fields away, <laughs> running like stink to get to you. Um, if, if he's doing that, you have got to be absolutely prepared and ready. No second chances. Uh, look at me. I'm not even reading my notes now, am I? But um, you, you, you really want to be going out with certainly at the very least for looking a good pair of binoculars like these. Good pair. These are 100 quid, almost chuck away, because I lose so many of them. It's untrue. Um, if I, if, if, if actually cheap pairs, you don't lose. It's the expensive ones you do. But, you know, give yourself a, a, a bit of a, a helping hand there. Wear hearing defenders. Hearing defenders are about 20 quid these days. You might say to yourself, oh, I'm OK. I don't need that. I tell you, my hearing now, because of not wearing hearing defenders, it wasn't, you know, it, 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 in the sort of late 70s, early 80s. It, what you wouldn't hear, uh, you know, I found many people doing that. And you certainly can't put the big cans on your head. You can't hear anything then. You do need to hear. These little hearing defenders, marvellous little bits, put those in your ears. Okay. Um, and then if you're, if you're then out shooting, what? Here's the first thing I'm going to show you. This is a, a pump action shotgun. Okay. It's got a long barrel on it, but it's not really an ideal foxing tool. The reason I'm saying that is you wouldn't really, I wouldn't be comfortable shooting a fox up over 30 yards with that. that that's, that's the absolute, whatever sort of, however 
however heavy, this is a, a shotgun cartridge, however heavy a load, you get these in different loads, big heavy load in that, um, 30 yards is about it. You probably find more foxes shot with shotguns on shoots where they come out of coverts um, and they, they're shot by guns that way as an opportunist shot. And like I'm saying, it's not illegal, there's nothing wrong with that. But it, it, they're kind of okay, but, but it's not really my, my cup of tea. Pretty loud as well, you know, of course it's loud. Now, um, People have different, oh, <coughs> different uh, favoured types of, uh, of, of rifles. This is a 2-2 rimfire rifle. Oh, Dave, you dinosaur, how long have you had that? Well, I've actually had this since the sort of, I don't know, late 80s? Late, yeah, about late 80s, I would say. Um, and it's a great, this is, um, on, on the end here, you have silencers on these type of rifles. Probably, probably the most dangerous rifle there is. What, that, that piddly little thing? Oh, yeah, and I'll show you why. You see, this, this, can you see that? I don't know if you can. This is a, a, a 2 2 bullet. It zips along at just below the speed of sound. That will bounce. If it hits a stone, that bullet will bounce. It won't mushroom, really. It can, and it's going somewhere. Now, it's in my opinion, in my humble opinion, I think I've only sh probably shot what, half a dozen foxes with this round because I don't want to wound foxes, and it's a very small round, so it's fine for reasonably close work. There will be work, those of you out there saying, Dave, you know, we've shoot, shoot. well, I'm not, I'm not saying don't, I'm just saying from, I'm, I'm trying to show you from my point of view and the work that I do. This is my, <clears throat> this is my favorite uh, weapon for, for fox control. Now, here's the thing, Benjamin Franklin said, what did he say? Well, Benjamin Franklin said there are, oh, you're probably ahead of me, you're saying this stuff now, that he's saying that uh, there, are, there are two things, death and taxes. Well, this is my own matra, and remember this. Remember this if, you, if you're looking to get into this work. I really, I cannot impress on you enough. This is my third. That, when it's gone through there, is never ever going back in that chamber. So whatever work you are doing, you better be made absolutely sure, and I mean 100% sure that what you're doing is safe, okay? Because if you don't, that bullet zips along at 3,000 feet a second. And it's that, only that part that's zipping along. It's the speed and velocity that does it. It'll go for about three miles and still kill that thing, okay? Wow, Dave, we're not interested in this work. That's the, it's not. It's a case of evaluating what you do, um, being trained in what you do. Um, this is a, 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 a course which I uh, took, night shooting course. Um, but night shooting brings with it its own risks, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But these rifles have safety catch. I like this type of rifle because it's got a three-stage safety. Like that, everything's locked down. Second stage, you can, lift the, you can lift the bolt, you can't push it forward. Third stage is fire, which is, I've gone back onto, look at that, I've naturally, isn't that funny? I've naturally done that, I put the safety catch straight back on and there's me trying to show you what I'm doing as a safety angle. That's, that's just me, and you get your red dot on there. Um, the, this scope on this rifle probably costs more than the rifle. Well, it did cost, not probably, it did. Um, but it's, it's a big scope and it's great for nighttime vision, okay? Um, at dusk, that, that scope, which is really what you're looking at, is it, at dusk, if you can get more light into that scope, that's when, do you know, that's the time when you'll really start to see foxes about. When those bushes turn, oh, is that shape moving? It, it's, it's, hey, here he comes. Whoa, he's here. You know, that's when you'll really start to see uh, the majority of your foxes. Now, if you're not ready, ready for your fox, <laughs> and you're on the back foot. It's not a good place to be. So what do I mean about being ready? Well, here is, excuse the squeaky chair, that's the chair now. Um, here we have the... <laughs> this is a, 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 a... I can't put the whole lot... Well, maybe I can. This tripod here, you can have it at any different angle you want to. But the great thing about it is... 
You never ever freak, for goodness sake, you'd never ever free, free hand shoot a fox. It goes onto here like so. But the great thing about this is, look, you can turn the whole thing around. So if, if he's sort of caught you with your pants down and he's to the left hand side, whoa, hang on, rather than making a, a big movement, you can follow anywhere across that area, okay? And it's a wonderful solid, it's a solid rest. So when your bullet is going out at the end, it's as rock steady as it can be. Now it might be that you, you shoot, we've got a slap, we were out last night, chicken killers. It was, my, it was minus two degrees. It was freezing cold. I tell you what, the foxes were there, and for what it's worth, one of them had actually beat us to it, and we saw him walking away with his, uh, well, he had a rabbit in his mouth this time, but off he went, you know, he beat us to it. So um, our, let's, let's look at these canny foxes now, okay? The ones that really, you know, wily as a fox. Well, you bet. So there's Dave, chucked himself into the bottom of the hedge. Actually, let me just tell you, last year, um, where I knew there was a fox, I chucked myself in the bottom of a furze bush, and, and do you know, true, a fox came running out of the hedge, and he was so fast at running in, he actually hit my boot. He was so interested in what was there. Bang! I've never had that happen before in <clears throat> years. But he actually hit my boot and went off again. He, whoa, when he knows what happened. You'll often find, while I'm thinking of it, when a fox is running like that, Oi, give him a shout, give him a little bit of a, or even just a, and it's just that second you'll stop and you'll think, did you really, boof, okay? Don't let them just, you might not stop them. If their head's down and they're going, they're gone. But there's, there's me in a hedgerow, squeaking away. But if your fox is a real canny old clever boy, you think, I know this game, I know what this chap's up to. Maybe somebody else has had a go at him and he thinks, I know what's going on here. Now this, look at this. Great, Dave, it's a bit of plastic. What are you doing there? Well, I'll switch it on. Now, you'll have to, I wish we were doing this outside, but we're not. We're, 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 we're in a, you know, sort of classroom environment for one of the better terms. But this can be 100 yards away now in a field, right? Listen to this. This is the, this is the other, it's the only bit of technology I actually use. But listen. I'm going to turn it up. You're going to put that on, don't bore the fox with it. I tell you, he's heard that. He's quarter of a mile away, he's heard it, assuming it's not blowing a hoolie. He'll have heard that, and his ears will prick up. If you're really tuned in, you'll see him. If you've got country eyes, you'll see that fella coming, whether he's coming down a hedgerow, whatever he does, but he'll hear. But the great thing is, if that's out in the middle of the field, he's not thinking, whew, I've got to go towards that hedgerow, I can go straight to that. Oh, I've seen foxes actually pick this fella up and try and run off with it, true. They'll pick this thing up and try and run off with it. But it's got great, uh, some other uh, sounds on it. I know it's a bit trendy, but if he hasn't responded to that one call, there's a load of foxes out in there, Saturday. go away, go on. Go on, be off with you. Um, so a great bit of kit for those jobs where, and remember people are paying you for this work. I'm gonna watch my timing. Um, people are paying you for this work. If you have those canny foxes, that little bit of kit, stick it in your pocket. Don't forget to put that back with it as well. Um, but we, we're really talking here up to now about these sort of daytime foxes. I now want to go on to, I know I'm a bit of a dinosaur in this work, and I'm not, I'm not saying this for effect. This is me, you know, this is, this is what I do. And I, yeah, I, I get a bit enthusiastic about it, but nighttime foxes bring a tremendous amount of risk. I can't tell you, the risk is off the scale. And if you're going to be doing nighttime foxing, you want to be as clued. It doesn't matter too much. No disrespect to other forms of pest control, but nighttime shooting of foxes is probably about as hairy as it's going to get. So you want to make sure you are 100% sure of what you're doing. So what have we got? Well, I know you folks laugh at me. This is my, this is my torch. Dave's old torch. Look at this. Well, I use this to scan across a field. Hell of a beam on this thing, by the way, look. And I'll scan across the field. 
If I pick up eyes, and by that I'm talking about the reflecting of the eyes, I'm going to go on to our third word of the day here. Dave, <laughs> look at you with your Latin. Well, exactly. It's the tapetum lucidum. Oh, didn't know what's that. What have you got problems with there? That is the back of your eyes here, the tapetum lucidum. Now, you'll find that animals that are crespuscular or are um, not night animals, that will reflect a lot more because they are looking to gain as much light into there. They've naturally evolved that way. We haven't, but you know, you'll find it on photographs at parties. You'll see that that's happened. But with foxes, um, deer, sheep, all these different animals, you'll find that that, is, that reflects back a lot. Here's a tip about foxes. You shine in across a field with your old uh, ambulance torch like this. You, you might pick up some eyes at, say, well, let's say 200 yards away, something like that. The wonderful Dave, well, come on, I mean, this has been over 40 years. I can tell you oh, straight, straight away, okay, that's a roe deer, there's a sheep. Most time with the foxes, they'll be looking, you'll get the two eyes looking together rather than just one sideways on. Just a little tip for you there. You might even be using a little, you know, doofer type torch, as long as you can see those eyes reflecting back, don't, I'm not talking about, look, I'm not talking about doing like this. I'm talking about when you've identified, just bring your, your, uh, your, your, your lamp just off it. You'll still see that reflection. And with a, a good scope, you've still got that uh, same amount of uh, identification of the animal. And you need to make sure you've got 100% a good background. If he's on top of a hill, how far is the bullet gonna go? Did you? Come on, pay attention. It's three miles and it's still killing at that range. Never ever shoot where you think that you're gonna be uh, in or not, not hitting a, a background or that animal, end of, okay? Now there are some other brand new, brand new, they're probably not, they've probably been around for about 10, 20 years. Okay, I'll put my dinosaur head on. I don't use this stuff. I know there's people out there say, it's the best stuff ever. This is a thermal imager. I'm not saying it's not good. It is fantastic stuff. I mean, technology these days, wow, we, you know, I can't even turn a blinking, you know, webinar thing on. But look, this is a thermal imager. And if you shine that across, there's about a thousand pounds worth of kit there. If you shine that across, well, just put it on, anything just glows as a heat source. And I'm talking two fields away. Fantastic for identifying where that heat source is. You could, you could argue this is a much safer way because you're identifying, you know, where the heat source is before you, and, and, and it gives you acres of time to think about what's going to happen first before you've even started your campaigns, okay? This is infrared. And this will go onto the back of, oh, I'll get me groaning when I get up and down these days. <clears throat> this fella will fit onto the back of here and you have that you can either scan with it put it onto there your infrared device then illuminates your fox with that infrared uh, he, he doesn't well he does know about it there is a red light comes out of there if you've had a fox that's been shot before he'll know all about it and he won't go any you know, he's, he's gone the fella's gone you, actually that might be just the fella that you'll get in the middle of the daytime when everybody else is, uh, you know, not thinking about fox control. So um, there are lots of different ways and methods of controlling foxes. And I think what I want to say is that the, the don't, don't be fooled too much by, you know, what the media or, or, or can I be so bold as to say, you know, pop stars and rock stars that are giving wild animals names uh, will have far, far more credibility than silly old Dave Archer will ever have. Now, I'm trying to show you here what I do and why I do it and what the sort of the, the real reason for me doing this work is. Um, and I hope that we are, you know, getting there as to, as to why we do it. We, we, we haven't got really that much uh, time to go through this, but... Let me just go through another couple of things just to talk it through. Um, anybody got any three in one? Right. I always take with me 
when I'm out there. We're talking about your first chance. Dave's mantra, your first chance is your best chance. How many times do you hear me saying this? Well, when it's gone wrong for you, you think, <clears throat> I forgot that one. And it's true. You know, don't go out, you know, without without your bullets. Don't go out with your, without your zero is on, completely on for your rifle, i.e. you know exactly where it's going to. Um, even with a big rifle like that, do you know, I don't ever take foxes really, I mean, 200 yards. That's a long old shot for, for you could say, you, you're saying this thing goes for three miles. Yeah, but you, you don't want to ever be wounding or maiming. You want to be giving yourself the best chance you can of getting it. So... Everything I've got is in my bum bag, okay? Now, I've got everything in here from little bits of tissue for wiping the lens caps to, uh, what else have we got in here? Gloves, whatever you want to say. Even when it gets cold like last night, I've got, you know, these gloves in. I'm not a great fan of wearing these type of gloves, to be honest, because you lose sensitivity on triggers, okay? Um, and when we're talking about uh, our scent, whatever work you're doing, remember your scent is going all over the area that you're, you're working in. Now, I find that if it's, I'll go back to our areas where foxes are predating, they, they, they kind of use, they, they know human spell. But if you're, if you're looking to sort of set something like this in the field, Get your scent on that, and actually he's going. Oh, I know he's here. Well, I'm not going to go near that. So once again, you, 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 your field craft wasn't quite up to scratch. So if you are going to set, you know, any devices, or you're doing any calling or anything, whatever way you're doing it, um, you need to make sure that you're not contaminating an area with scent, and, and you're working nice and quietly. Um, right. So the other thing I wanted to say, and I've left this till last now. Because I always think if you're talking about things, you you know, I don't know how much percentage of stuff people can retain, but I've left this till the last part. See this rifle? To my mind, this is one of the, uh, the human, a human not failing, but again, this is your bullet point, and I want you to remember this one. You have, remember we were talking about the one, two, three on the safety catch? Nothing comes up there, then you're getting ready to fire, and then you fire. Now, it might well be that your fox that you're after, just at that point where you think, okay, here we go, we're gonna pull the trigger. The fox might, for instance, turn, you might not be able to see it, and something else has happened. Here's your bullet point again. Always, 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 always put that safety catch back on. So when you've gone like that, don't think, oh, get that safety catch back on. I take, Every time, three bullets with me. It's, it's, it, it's not superstition. I'm not superstitious. Um, touch wood. Um, those three bullets represent to me the fact that I know I've got three bullets. And do you know what? Here's the thing. Even what, if I haven't shot or taken a shot, maybe it didn't appear that evening, and I've taken those three bullets out of the gun, I will still always put my little pinky up there just to make sure there's nothing in it. Can you believe that? But it's just being safe and making sure that we are absolutely doing our job the safest way we can. Now, I know we've had to sort of whiz along here and, and I've talked, I had all, you know, I've gone a, 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 that's fine. I mean, we've still covered everything that we need to cover. I've just given you a taster. It's just been a taster of the work I do. And then we can be the work that you do, okay? Um, the final thing to say is, if you want to get into this kind of, it would take you a long time now to get a firearm like that, and you have to be of impeccable character. Well, you've got one, Dave. <laughs> um, if you've ever had any problems, uh, you know, with, with sort of legal side of things, then this probably isn't for you, okay? But thank you for listening. Um, the final, final bit, of, if, if it's snowing now in your part of the world, just get out there at dusk and just have a look. If you can practice your sweep, have a little look and with your torch and see how many eyes you can see. You'd be amazed how many foxes are out there. Hello, Natalie. How are you doing? Hi, Dave. You're all right. That was amazing. Your enthusiasm. I was good. I was trying to do the whistle thing. Ah, I do it. I can't do it. And there'll be some, uh, it sound like constipated ducks tonight. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah just, no, it sounds like I'm blowing a raspberry. That's all it sounds like. So, yeah, not, not great. 
but but it's like yeah but i mean come on when there was a, when you went to a piano you didn't start to play beethoven straight away it's all practice and working on it last night you know it was so windy and cold i could feel my, and i couldn't squeak last night you know so yeah, yeah okay Fantastic. Well, my dog started barking anyway when you started doing those cool, uh, with that rabbit call. I was like, oh, we got to close the door. And, yeah. So, thank oh, you for that. Um, great. We, we've got like 15 questions, Dave, but unfortunately, we haven't got any time to, to get to those. But if you're okay with us um, popping them over to you so you can. We'll send them over to you. I think one of my colleagues is going to print them out for you, and you can you can you can type some answers, and then we can send it off to them. Is that okay? It'd be an absolute pleasure. No fantastic, problem. fantastic. So I know there's so many questions. There. I can't choose one that kind of represents them all. So do you know what? Rather than doing that, let's get them out to you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can see what you're saying. Yeah. Oh, yeah, somebody yeah. Said, uh, somebody said bum bags are underrated. Oh, bum bags, yeah. <laughs> oh, they are. I that, yeah. yeah, I can bring them back into fashion. Okay, yeah, brilliant. Absolutely. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, keep yeah. safe, everyone. And thank you for, for your time. And um, yeah, I'll do all those questions for you, of course, I will. Great. So much. Thank you so much, Dave. All right. Take care.